Welcome to Inside Medicine. We're here today with the Dean of the new UNLV School of Medicine, uh, Dr. Barbara Atkinson, and uh, thank you for being with us today. Dr. Atkinson, welcome to the studio. Thank you. It's exciting so, here. Yes, it's exciting times for UNLV. You've got a brand new School of Medicine that's going to be opening up here pretty soon. Give us a high level. What does that look like? And tell us a little bit more about it. Well, it looks like if we have one more step in the accreditation, if we pass that, we would be able to accept students in October this next fall who would start the next summer. So it's really coming up fast. That's awesome. So what did that uh, accreditation process look like? Tell us a little bit. Keep in mind, our, our audience, they're typically the medical professionals, the physicians in the community, the nurses in the community. So we could talk a little bit uh, deeper lingo if you'd like. And so tell us a little bit about that accreditation process. So I came in May almost two years ago, spent about the first six months talking to people in the community, learning what this community needs and, and what what we need to do here, and then started recruiting people and then had, by a year later, by December, this last December, had to have a document of 475 pages. That's big. Gigantic, that outlined everything from the curriculum, the 10-year financial plan, the bylaws for the faculty, the student handbook, admissions, you name it, everything about a medical school. It was reviewed in February, and I got a phone call to say that we were offered a site visit. So they're going to come. This is the last hurdle. They're going to come in July, spend three days reviewing everything with us, being sure that we didn't lie in our big document, mm -hmm. that we really have what we said we had. And then we hope they'll, when they meet in October, they'll give us the permission to accept students. That's great. So... You get approved. When do you start accepting students? What does that process look like? So they meet on October 17th and 18th. If they give us permission, we push a button on the computer and out comes as many thousand of applications as, as have said they want to be interested in our school. There's a central process for medical school applications. One place in Washington, D.C., where everybody sends their applications. They say where they're interested in applying. But they hold all that until they give us permission. And then the minute we get permission, which is literally in the middle of the meeting, we we get the application. So and people today are selecting, I would like to go to the UNLV School of Medicine. You just don't know who they are yet. Exactly. And I think they're selecting, well, they'll be selecting really August and September uh, what schools they want to go to. But we'll be getting a lot of applications because we have scholarships for the whole first class for all four years. Tell us a little bit about that. I think that's uh, it's not a first of its kind, but it's surely not a common thing. You raised money to scholarship the entire first class, and tell us about the importance of that. So we did. We did it during the legislative session to show the legislators how much support in Las Vegas there really is for the school. So we asked uh, donors for $100,000 for $25,000 of tuition for each year for four years. We got the money in less than 60 days. Wow. It was amazing. And the Engelstadt Foundation, I have to say, gave 25 scholarships for the first class, but 25 more for the second, 25 for the third, and 25 for the fourth. So we are taking 60 students, and so we'll have almost half scholarship at least even in the second, third, and fourth classes. Wow, that's amazing. So what does that mean for student recruitment? How does that change the game? It really does. We'll be a little late starting the application process. Other schools will get their applications beginning in August and September. We won't until a little later. But $100,000 of tuition, when the average debt that medical students graduate with is about $175,000. Wow. It'll make a big difference. We will get the students that we want. And you we're getting calls every day now about it. So define the perfect student. Those that are out there, what does the perfect student look like for you? Our perfect student is from Nevada, uh, likes to stay here, has family here, has connections here if they're not from Las Vegas. When we're going to interview every Las Vegas student who meets the very bare minimum of requirements in terms of grades and scores and so on. Um, it might be older, might have had a different career and be changing into medicine, might be very diverse, might be a first generation student. Those are all students that like to stay. They already have roots in the community. They don't want to be far from their families. And so we think those are the ideal students. We think having other things than just medicine is important. So, so they could actually be other majors and other kinds of things, but they do have to take the prerequisites. 
And then we, we think they need to have some experience that they can talk about that says why they want to be a doctor. They've done something in a research lab. They've done something following doctors. They've actually done some kind of public service uh, for the community. And because they're from Nevada, they're more than likely to stay here. Is that part of the overall goal of the UNLV School of Medicine? Absolutely. It's the prime goal. That seemed to me, as I was talking to people in the very beginning, the absolute basic thing is this place needs more doctors. Uh, Some will go away to get residencies or fellowships somewhere else. But we hope they'll come back, that they'll be so tied to the community, they'll come back. And we hope we can actually build the residencies and fellowships that they'll need so they wouldn't have to go away to get them either. So can you give us a sneak peek of what that looks like? Obviously, uh, Las Vegas Heels has been deeply involved in GME expansion. We started that conversation Mm -hmm. several years back. Uh, Proud that the governor gave $10 million to build this infrastructure. For UNLV, what does that mean and what does that look like for you down the road? So we're actually right now in the process of applying for money from that $10 million to actually expand some residencies. We want to expand the primary care residencies first, and that's that's um, going to be for us family medicine, and family medicine with geriatrics in particular, a huge need for this community, and psychiatry, another huge need in the community. But then what we need to do is add fellowships. This city only has three fellowships now in medicine, uh, only has cardiology, pulmonary, and GI. It's missing kidney, cancer, rheumatology, you name it, go right through the list. There's about 20 other kinds of subspecialties of internal medicine that we don't have. And then we don't have any in pediatrics. And that's actually, if anything in this city, pediatrics is the biggest need, the pediatric higher level specialty subspecialty. So we've heard that it's oftentimes difficult to start a fellowship program unless you've got academic medicine in the community, just because those practitioners like to be around academic medicine. Is that what you have found in the past? Exactly. And that's what our intention is, is to hire the faculty who will teach medical students, but then be able to start the specialty fellowships and residency programs that we don't have right now. It's just too bad because medical students that are graduating now even the the ones from University of Nevada School of Medicine, they want to go into a few specialties that don't exist in Las Vegas. They like dermatology, ophthalmology, neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, um, anesthesiology, radiology, pathology even, um, and we just don't even have them. They leave because they uh, can't get them, except one of them, orthopedics, is starting this July. So That's awesome. So tell us about faculty. Where are you in that process? What does that look like? Um, you know, you need these specialists to come in to develop these programs. Mm-hmm. Where do you find them? So we're recruiting right now from the outside. We've got the leadership in place in each of the areas, the three main areas of research, clinical activities, and education. The education people, as you might imagine, have been working for over a year to get everything ready for for that, and the admissions people. They've all come from all over the country. Um, The uh, head for clinical affairs just started, Tracy Green. She was the chief medical officer for the state of Nevada. By the way, that's an amazing recruit for you. Congratulations. That is, uh, she is unbelievable. I feel bad for the state of Nevada because she's been an (laughs) asset for the state for many, many of years. That's a great recruit. I hope they can recruit somebody as good as she is because we need somebody good at that level to work with. Absolutely. And we just recruited the head for research, uh, Parvesh Kumar, who is going to be leading our cancer effort. He came from Kansas where I was before, and he's starting in like dynamite. He just started on Monday, so Monday a week ago. Um, So it is really pretty remarkable. But anyway, those are coming from the outside. We have faculty from the University of Nevada School of Medicine who are moving over to us in the summer of, of 2017. But we're going to continue to recruit from the outside. So We had six people in July of this last year. We now have 27 faculty and staff. By by next year, we're going to have to recruit 40 more. So we're supposed to be at 68 um, by about a year from now. And then 120 will move over from UNSUM. That's great. So tell us about the structure. What does this look like? How many departments? Uh, What does that, you know, are you finding those department heads? Uh, are they locals? Are they coming in from out of market? What does the the infrastructure of the school look like? Yeah. So 
the three, so I'm Dean and we have the three top leaders, Mm -hmm. education, research, and clinical. We have some structure under that. I hired first a chief of staff, uh, HR person, uh, development person, a communications person. So those kinds of staff people. But now we're at the, the recruiting the chairs uh, level. So there are 24 departments that were approved by the Board of Regents. Um, they're all clinical departments. So surgery was divided up into um, multiple subspecialty surgery. So there's an ENT department, uh, orthopedics department, and so on. Uh, I took some of the pieces of of internal medicine out, too, and made separate departments with them, cardiology, oncology, geriatrics. The reason for that is those are areas I want to build research programs. So it's going to be very important that that a chair of that department brings in a whole research group with Ph.D. um, basic scientists as well as clinical scientists in it. And then uh, the essentially every specialty. It's hard to find a specialty I don't have a department of. That's great. That doesn't mean I have a chair of them or even will have it in the real near term. The basic clerkship chairs need to be recruited first. So we're looking at, we have just recruited an outside recruiter. We're just ready to put an RFP out to get an outside recruiter to help us um, hire a few of the, of the really important chairs. And I'll just say an internal medicine chair is the basis sure. of an entire school of medicine. That's the foundational piece. And we have to recruit somebody extremely good in that position. We have some really good chairs who are currently at Unsum who are going to move over as chair as well. So we'll gradually fill in the spaces with, with good people in each of those areas. But it's a totally different looking med school. Of uh, totally different. And so when somebody comes in, say, an internal medicine chair, they'll recruit a division chief in each of the big divisions and build out the whole school. And a department of medicine can have sometimes 75 or 100 people in it. Actually, a, a moderate size uh, academic medical school can have that big a department of medicine. So we have a lot of recruiting to do. That's fantastic. So there's a practice plan that comes behind the medical school. Tell us a little bit about that and the population that it'll serve. What does it look like now? What does it look like in three years, five years? Give us a, well, a, a preview of that. So we just had uh, the Board of Regents just approved our practice plan at the meeting last week. It's uh, Actually, the plan itself is just a 501c3 corporation that holds money. It has a structure in terms of a governance structure, and it has uh, bylaws that set up how the faculty can get get paid. And our faculty will have an incentive plan where they'll get extra money if they do a good job on the clinical side. But if they do a good job on the education and research side, they'll also be eligible for extra money. So the plan itself is is not that pertinent. The practice itself sure. is where it really is important. And so the way we're envisioning it, and Tracy Green would be a wonderful person to come and talk about it uh, at some point, But we're planning on having three community practices, each of them aimed at Medicaid populations, each of them teaching practices, so faculty teaching both residents and students, each of them with all the clerkship uh, specialties. So that's the primary care specialties of internal medicine, family medicine, and pediatrics, but it's also OBGYN, surgery, and psychiatry, neurology, behavioral health. So... It really will be a full-service practice. We'll have, be able to take care of whole families. We'll be trying to really make it a hospitality practice where it'll actually feel good to go to the doctor's office instead of... Imagine that. <laughs> imagine that <laughs> instead of one of those tortures where you sit around all day. And, and trying to get everything in one site. So it's really the most one-stop shopping it can be. So you piqued my interest, hospitality. Uh, We have spent a tremendous amount of time on this concept of medical tourism. And can we uh, position Las Vegas to become a destination for health? We look at the uh, hotel school over at UNLV as a huge asset to that. Do you work with the hotel school? How do you work with them? What does that look like? just seems like there's a ton of knowledge there that makes sense to bring into medicine. And that's something that would be unique Uh, to Las Vegas. It really is. And this is the place to do it. Uh, We're working very closely with the dean of the school, Stowe Schumacher. Um, It's really important right now because even 
regular practices and hospitals are getting extra revenue uh, for each patient based on patient satisfaction. So it's turned out to be something that's really captured a lot of people's interest. So we're going to be giving a certificate in in hospitality and healthcare. Yeah. We're working on that program. It'll probably be online, but mostly we're going to look at it in terms of how the practice is, itself is built, how it's scheduled, how doctors are treat their patients, how different levels of medical providers give the top of the care of their level and are supervised. And we'll have students in a variety of other things besides just physician students. We'll have all kinds of nurse practitioners, medical assistants, physician assistant students um, from, from our other universities in town. So we'll have sites for them to, to actually get educated as well. What struck me when we were thinking about the hospitality piece is how intentional the hotel industry is and how they treat their customers, if you will. Um, I, when you have the experience in a good hotel, you know you've had a good experience, but you don't realize what's gone into the planning of making that experience. So we're working with them to really try to understand how to do that and how to convert that into a medical experience. Seems like that uh, knowledge basis here. So it should be an easy thing to transfer over to medicine. It's really exciting. That's great. And we'll be announcing a big grant in the next, um, I don't know, a couple months that we've gotten. And one of the, it has three pieces to it. One of them is to support the hospitality um, piece. One of them is to support bioethics in healthcare. And one of them is uh, to support population health management. So sort of the three things that I think are going to be core for our practices. Yep. So all of the new students coming in, they're going to be trained as an EMT first. What's the reasoning, the rationale behind that, and how will that produce a different or a better student? So the rationale is that they'll find out right away that they can do something. They can assess patients quickly, they can give a treatment quickly, and they'll see real patient care in action. Um, and there'll be some of them who might not like it as much as they thought they did, uh, but they'll find out the f- beginning and not at the beginning of their third year. Uh, I think they'll all like it, um, but it'll be a very exciting way to start. If there should be a, a disaster, we'll have our students all uh, four years worth able to help, which is something. But the real basis of it is, for one thing, it'll teach teamwork and teams that are mixed teams that are not just physicians. They'll be taught by non-physicians. We're going to build in public health. Um, that's something that they'll get to see in a way that they wouldn't see it. And they'll be in houses and places that they might never have seen, but they'll be able to see, some will be accidents, but they'll see diseases that should have been treated different ways that might not have gotten to that stage. And we'll be teaching the public health and diversity all at the same time during that six weeks. So where's the School of Medicine going to be? Do we know yet? We don't exactly know yet. Um, we think it'll be in the medical district of sure. Las Vegas. That That's one thing. Uh, it could be on the Shadow Lane campus. Um, the Shadow Lane campus is big enough to hold it. That's where the dental school is, and that's a, a great location. It would be nice if it could be on the county land that where the old health district hospital was, mm-hmm. but we're still negotiating with the county uh, about that land transfer. You bet. So the VA hospital was gracious enough to give you a home uh, to get started. How did that come about? It seems uh, like a unique relationship. It really has been right from the beginning. The VA um, is really an exciting place. It's new. It's growing so fast it can hardly keep up with it. Um, Ramu Kamandori, who's the chief medical officer for the VA, and I met right in the beginning and talked about what we could do together. And we know we want to build a research project in mental health and addiction there because there's a lot of need in the whole community. Again, another area that we really want to touch on and certainly a lot of need in the VA system. And in talking about the education and where our temporary space could be, they offered space that's just ideal for our our students starting until we get our first medical education building built. So they would be doing two days a week, 
and it would be the first class doing two days and when we have two classes the second class too so there'll be four days a week worth of our students there and they'll spend that time doing their small group learning. Mm -hmm. It's a problem-based learning curriculum, and they'll be supplying the facilitators, the faculty, for those those sessions. And then they'll be spending the other two days back on the Shadow Lane campus where we're building out the second floor over the dental school. So it's a good mix of spaces, and it, it'll be a good for the interim, but the sooner we can start the medical education building, the better. So it seems like some of this is almost similar to the plan down in uh, Florida at Lake Nona. So you've got the VA right. and the, the new medical school there. Have you been able to collaborate with those folks? And it's nice to take best pra practices from somebody after they've gotten started. We certainly did right from the beginning. Um, Deb German, who's the dean there, has been a good friend of mine for a long time. And she came and she was one of the people that helped actually articulate what the need was in Las Vegas. Interestingly enough to me, the way this school actually got finally sold was on the economic need. It wasn't sold on the health care needs. So tell us about that. You know, obviously, uh, we're deeply involved. Las Vegas Heels is with what we call that Eds and Meds initiative. And uh, we see this as an economic development tool. Uh, what does it mean economically to the community? And on top of that, I think it provides what we've been desperately uh, in need of, and that's a stronger health care delivery system, a pipeline of future talent. But there's an economic driver behind it that sold the package. What what was that? So it was a consultant that came in, uh, the Trip Umbach Group, that does a, an analysis of every medical school in the country and what the impact, financial impact of that medical school is. And their estimate of what was missing in Las Vegas by not having a full public medical education academic health center kind of model here was about $1.2 billion wow. a year of economic development, a whole sector of the economy just missing. Now with the, the uh, health district and the medical district planning of the city of Las Vegas, they're estimating that what would grow up around a medical school in the medical district, it would be worth uh, $3.6 billion a year wow. and 22,000 new jobs. It That's is huge. It's huge. That's it's huge. huge. It actually would have cushioned the recession in Las Vegas because that was the one sector of the economy that grew during the recession. And, you know, those kind of numbers might or might not turn out to be right. But I actually, when I first read them, believed them because at University of Kansas Medical Center, where I was, the university, the medical school was exactly on $1.2 mm -hmm. It's now higher than that, but that's what it was four years ago. And then the hospital last year generated $4 billion of revenue. Wow. And it was going bankrupt 15 years ago. So it was it's not a huge that turnaround. huge turnaround. And so... We should see something, even if yeah. not quite as high as those estimates are. Yeah. So you came out of retirement for this. Yes. What brought you? <laughs> how, how did that happen? And how do you leave retirement? Uh, you you were in Kansas. You lived in Florida. You have a house there to come to Las Vegas, the middle of the desert. What sold you besides Don Snyder? Uh, Don <laughs> Snyder was big part of it. What really sold me was the vision at the school level the vision at the NC level, and just the thought of what you can really, how you could really plan. These doctors are going to be practicing for 50 years. It really, how you think about what they need to know, how you can teach them to, it isn't actually the facts that you teach them today that are going to make any difference to them in 50 years or even probably 10 years. It's how you teach them to think, mm -hmm. how you could really think about the very best ways to do that. And how you can come up with some things that really will make a difference in, in their lives and the in the lives of the patients here in Las Vegas. It just it's an incredible opportunity. I feel really honored to be asked to think about it, and not to mention to actually do it. You bet. So, how have you found the the Las Vegas community, both as a whole as well as the healthcare community? 
Oh, I found it to be great. I think the healthcare community gets a bad rap sometimes. We're a unique bunch. <laughs> well, it gets a bad rap just because they're not enough. It's not necessarily yeah. that there aren't some really great people and programs here. There are, but there's not enough. So people have trouble getting in. They have trouble finding the right person. It just isn't organized. It'll be good to put an end to the discussion that we've had bad healthcare. We've had amazing practitioners. Absolutely. We just haven't had enough. Yeah, and absolutely. Uh, if you look at the quality of the doctor, Doctors that are out there, I think they're they're second to none. Uh, we've got amazing. Again, it'll be great to develop these programs, and thank you for that. That's uh, huge for Las Vegas. We're very grateful to have a medical school here. That's awesome. That's great. So, for disclosure purposes, I do sit on the community advisory board for UNLV, and I'm grateful for that. But uh, you and I have gotten to know each other over the years, a uh, year and a half at least, mm-hmm. uh, and we started doing what we called the Dean's Dinner. Uh, and so the Dean's Dinner, just to give the audience a little bit of what that is. And um, so we invited yourself, the Dean of uh, the Toro School of Medicine and Roseman School of Medicine, and started talking about, hey, how do we all come together and collaborate? Your personal experience, how has that dinner been? How has it affected uh, UNLV's role in the community? And has it been beneficial? It really has. I mean, it's just important for us to keep talking about what we're doing, trying to coordinate how things are going to work. Uh, We're going to be working on a big health science library that ought to support everybody. We're going to be working on fourth year electives for medical students that could be available to students. Those are used as auditions for residencies. So you Everybody, it's in everybody's best interest to jointly have students uh, take things at different places. So we're really thinking there's a lot we can do. Our curriculum is going to be very different at the beginning, but in the fourth year, when it comes to that, it gets to be very similar. So um, there are just a lot of things. It's very exciting to have a new dean uh, just started at Turo. So we're anxious to work with him as well. We had him in the studio the other day. He seems like a, a great guy. He uh, came from Kansas City. He has Kansas. To be Everybody great. comes from Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us, uh, you know, moving from Kansas here, was there anything in Las Vegas that just shocked you? Well, the lack of, of enough doctors and particularly enough residencies is an absolute shock. Everybody I bring in to interview just is astounded. I was in Philadelphia before I was in Kansas and was dean there, too. And there are five medical schools. I mean, it is a totally different uh, model and how this city has lasted this long with so few doctors and so so little training. of. So we won't hit oversaturation with three medical schools? Not at all. In Philadelphia, most of the medical schools had 250, 200 to 250 students in a class. And even in Kansas City, which is the same size as Las Vegas, there are three medical schools. University of Kansas has 225 and is over 100 years old. University of Missouri, Kansas City has 175 in a class. And the osteopathic school, which is a very good one in Kansas City, has something over 200. So we are way below that. You bet. So what other ways do you see yourself working with the medical schools? What does... You know, it's unique. We're probably the only city in the country right now that has two brand new medical schools coming out of the ground. I think we uh, in the community are going to benefit from that. It seems like there's a lot going on in medicine. So what are the other areas that you could see some collaboration happening? I think the GME piece is a very big one because we all need that. And the city and state need that as well. So I think that's probably the biggest the biggest area in addition to the fourth year of medical education. You bet. So we had you in the studio earlier today to film a piece for the Clark County Medical Society Alliance. Uh, Las Vegas Heels has been working very closely with this group. Uh, They're an amazing organization. Uh, All of the revenue that they raise goes to philanthropic endeavors. Uh, We work closely with them to get alignment, to get these funds to go to the medical schools equally. Uh, Just last week, we delivered a check to the Clark County Medical Society Alliance that's going to benefit the medical schools, and they've got a a conference coming up. Tell us, just give us a sneak peek. Where's that money going to go for UNLV? What does that Right. For the other schools, I think it mostly goes for scholarships. But since we have those, um, ours is going to go toward projects in the community. So our students are going to have two hours a week um, 
for the whole four years where they do community service projects. And then they're going to spend the whole year embedded in the community as well. And then they'll have a one month uh, rotation in the fourth year where they go to some kind of community agency, something, something like the Nathan Adelson Hospice, like Opportunity Village or a hotline, a crisis hotline. So during that time, they're going to do a, a project there and they'll have a research paper with it. And those, this money for our students will support them to be able to do those projects and get some outside help or get some ability to do some extra things during those, those community service periods. And I think they'll be very excited about that. Yeah, we're looking forward to the fashion show. It's I hear yeah. it's quite the event. Uh, Five hundred uh, physician spouses in a room yeah. uh, supporting medical education can't get better than it that. It is. I just have to thank the Clark County Medical Society Alliance. They have been great partners. We've talked to them throughout the whole whole time we've been building. We've talked to them about what they see as the needs in the community, and they are wonderful people. You bet. Anything else that you want to talk while we have you in the studio here today? And we and, and for the audience, we do plan on hosting shows like this in the future. A lot of our initiatives here at Las Vegas Heels are around eds and meds, or what, we call, what we're calling it. Uh, so we want to invite you back to the studio on a frequent basis to give us updates. But is there anything else that you want to touch on today? Now's that time. No, I think this is very good for today. And this has been fun talking to you. And I love your new studio. So thank you. I'm we're happy to come back. <laughs> well, we're going to wrap up today. We're going to show a brief uh, video from the uh, UNLV School of Medicine. And we look forward to seeing everybody back here at Inside Medicine in the future. Thank you. But I think the groundswell has been here for, for a while. I've lived here now for 13 years, and a medical school has been discussed for, for quite a while down here. I think now is the time. It's not just in name. It builds everything, not just for students, but for the community as a whole. So not only will you get better health care, not only will you attract bright uh, students to, the, to go and attend school here and, and the plan being to try to draw them into staying and, and train and do their residencies here in town, which means we're going to build up our medical community in Las Vegas. This school and these students will be reaching out to this community and connecting and engaging with the community. This is why we have such high hope that we can do this, we can become a center of excellence. 